Ladies and gentlemen, um, from David Clary at Magdalen, I'm Andrew Graham, uh, the Master of Balliol, and we're the other college which is extremely grateful to be associated with the new Humanities Professorships. Um, David has already expressed a number of thanks, but I'd certainly like to underline our thanks to um, Lord and Lady Foster, Lena Foster in particular, for supporting these chairs, in particular the one held by Glenn Lowry, which is in the realm of museum galleries and libraries. Um, in terms of people who've put effort into making today happen, I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Seamus Perry, the fellow and tutor in English at Bailey, who's been, made a lot of the arrangements. As far as Glenn Lowry is concerned, there's a sense in which all I need to say and he's the director of MoMA in New York. Um, that almost does it. Uh, I mean, these days, if you are fortunate enough to travel around the world, you might begin to think that places like uh, art galleries in Sao Paulo or Berlin were beginning to uh, rise up and be perhaps touching what's happening in New York. But there's absolutely no doubt that MoMA led the way and is still the preeminent gallery in the world for modern art. And so we're extraordinarily fortunate to have Glenn Lowry, its director here today, to talk to us. He's going to be speaking about uh, the abodes of the muses theorizing MoMA. Um, since you're all in Oxford, you all know that the muses, uh, there are either supposed to be three of them, or in most accounts, possibly nine. Um, the daughters of Zeus, uh, and they are the people who are believed to have inspired uh, artists, literature, poetry, and especially philosophy. And since I'm from Balliol, uh, and we, our patron saint was believed very much in philosophers, it's particularly glad, nice of us to be able to have this chair associated with Balliol. When I was wondering what I, as an economist, could possibly say about uh, the theorizing of MoMA, um, I thought to begin with there would be no connection at all, and I certainly wouldn't wish to claim very much. But I don't know whether Glenn will be talking about this, but certainly in his writings, one of the things that he draws our attention to is the extent to which you go into some museums now, and they look like shops, and you go into other shops now, and they look like museums. And if we're in the world in which we are constantly trying to engage people on the other hand, but also stay authentic on the other, the second hand, I mean, the, in the world of art, there's still a need for authenticity, and in, years of need in a university, a need to stick with whatever happens to be the facts, even if they're a bit boring, that trying to pull those two things together to entertain people and bring them in, but to be authentic and to informing them is a challenge which we, I think, in the university can easily relate to. And, of course, we have many museums in Oxford, and we all go around using the word muse without always realizing it in terms of whether we're talking about being amusing or talking about music, etc., etc. It's all over the place. So it's a very great pleasure indeed to have Glenn Lowry here today talking about the abodes of the muses theorizing a mama. Glenn Lowry. Would it be possible to go to a blank screen for a moment? Thank you. Well. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for the invitation to join you here at Oxford this week. I'm thrilled to be here and want to especially acknowledge the support I've received from Norman and Elena Foster, who first broached the idea of taking on a visiting professorship here with me, but also to Seamus Perry, who has been endlessly patient and diligent in attending to all of the details involved in making this happen, and especially to Andrew Graham, the Master of Balliol College, for his hospitality, and to his wife as well, to them and everyone else involved in this enterprise, my heartfelt gratitude. I'm especially happy to be here with Thomas Struth, 
an artist I admire enormously and someone who has done more to think about museums, as you'll see in a moment, than almost anyone. Now, when Alexander Dorner, the German scholar and director of the Landesmuseum in Hanover wrote in 1927, the objective of an art museum is more than to position its treasures in an orderly fashion. An art museum is an educational facility whose purpose is first to develop a taste for the subject and secondly and more importantly to illustrate the developments of the human spirit in its most independent and liveliest object in art. He gave voice to a fundamental shift in the conception of the art museum that continues to reverberate today. Dorner, of course, was not the only museum director in the 1920s to make this kind of argument. But it was his thinking and writing that inspired other directors, like Alfred H. Barr, Jr. in the United States, to reimagine the museum, to think of it as something more than just an instrument of the Enlightenment designed to disseminate knowledge through the classification and ordering of objects of the past. Abodes of the Muses, theorizing the modern art museum, takes as its point of departure Dorner's sense of the art museum as a place of discovery and learning, a space inherently educational yet also spiritual, dedicated to creating a lifelong engagement with art and especially contemporary art. For it was Dorner, long before Barr and other directors of museums of modern art, who understood the importance of embracing the work of living artists and ensuring that their presence was part of a museum's program. Among his many radical innovations while in Hanover, where he remained until he fled to the United States in 1937 under Nazi pressure, was working with artists like the Russian constructivist El Lizitsky to design whole environments at the museum, what he called atmospheric rooms. These rooms were meant to complete the historical sequence of galleries at the Landis Museum and showcase the work of living artists, such as Piet Mondrian, Laszlo Moholy Naj, and Kazimir Malevich. The most famous of these environments, the so-called abstract cabinet, and now we can actually have the image that's possible, was a space meant to change with the viewer's perspective in order to appear dynamic and active in much the same way abstract art was understood to be optically dynamic and active. So what I hope to do this afternoon is to frame a number of larger questions and issues pertinent to how we think about art and art museums in general, and museums of modern art in particular. Throughout, my comments will be tempered what I, by what I take to be Dorner's principal insight, that living artists have a singularly important role to play in the shaping and defining of art museums, and that these institutions are not passive conveyors of knowledge and information, but dynamic places of encounter meant to create unique relationships with their public. In this context, I want to suggest that museums of modern art need to be understood, theorized if you wish, as disruptive institutions, to borrow a term from Clayton Christensen of the Harvard Business School. This is not to take away from other approaches to theorizing art museums that include seeing them as either a kind of shrine or spiritual space or a validating locus for works of art often closely tied to the market or as colonizing spaces to take but a few of the most cited approaches to studying these institutions. These are all useful and not mutually exclusive ways of examining art museums and their practices through the larger prism of positivist, Marxist, and post-colonial theory, to name several often used theoretical positions, and result in the reading of museums as places that can either fetishize objects, prize them for their artistic or monetary value, or see them as instruments of classification used to define people in their cultures, or all of the above. But none of these approaches explains why museums of modern art emerged as they did in the first decades of the 20th century, or what distinguishes them ontologically from historical museums. What follows then are three interlinked ideas or ways of thinking about museums of modern art. The first concentrates on artists and how they have viewed the art museum over the years. And while the artists I've chosen to highlight here are but a small sampling of the many 
who have dealt with the museum, either as a subject or an object, their work is broadly representative of how artists have approached the institution over the last 200 years. The second approach examines the modern art museum within its historical context and as a historical construct. And the third addresses the changing nature of these institutions today, while trying to suggest a couple of ideas that might be helpful in understanding their future. Think of this effort as a way of considering the museum as it has been imagined, as it is realized, and as it could be. Artists, of course, have had a long and engaged relationship with art museums for the obvious reason that museums have been, at least since the 19th century, the primary long-term repository for their work. They have also often been the venue where, because of their collections, a history of art is written. Thus, for artists, there's both a short-term value to museums as a source of patronage and a longer-term importance of museums as a means of securing a place in a broader history of art. And even if this has changed somewhat in the last 15 to 20 years with the explosion of private collections and galleries dealing with contemporary art, I doubt the larger issue of museums as primary repositories for artists' work will change. This creates a complex relationship between artists who want their work acquired and seen and institutions that constantly have to make judgments about artists and their work, judgments that often change Frustratingly so, I suspect, for many artists over time. Thus, if the art museum is a central institution for artists, it is also fraught with tensions. Gustave Caillebot, the French painter and collector, recognized this in his bequest to the French state in 1897 of 38 Impressionist and Post-Impressionist paintings by artists he admired and supported, including Manet, Monet, Renoir, Cezanne, among others. Caillebotte understood that the reception of these works by the French establishment would be controversial, despite his desire to see them inscribed into an official narrative. So he stipulated that, and I quote, I leave to the state the paintings in my possession. However, as I want this gift to be accepted, and in such guise that these paintings not end up in an attic or storage room of a provincial museum, boy, did he know museums, uh, <laughs> a certain lap, uh, but, rather in the Luxembourg and later uh, in the Louvre, a certain lapse of time will be necessary before the execution of this clause. Until, until the public may, I do not say understand, but admit this painting. 20 years or so might be required. In the meantime, my brother Marshall, or failing him, another of my heirs, will keep them. Kaibut, as it turns out, was not wrong in anticipating the hostility his gift would encounter when presented to the state's principal collecting institution for modern art, the Musée du Luxembourg. After years of debate and controversy, only half of the gift was ultimately accepted, and then only grudgingly. The rest of the paintings, for the most part, were acquired by Albert Barnes and are now part of the Barnes Foundation, which recently became the subject of a great deal of controversy in its own right uh, in Pennsylvania due to its perilous financial situation. Skepticism, or at least a mistrust of art museums on the part of French artists, has a long history. As early as 1796, Hubert Robert, who had become keeper of the king's paintings at the Louvre under Louis XVI, and luckily survived the revolution, produced imaginary view of the Grand Gallery of the Louvre in ruins. Although Robert made frequent use of the trope of ruins to the extent he was nicknamed Robert des Ruines, his paintings of the Grand Gallery uh, are notable for their majestic depiction of the Louvre with its great vaulted ceiling fallen and while, while plants grow from the remains of its arches as if it were an ancient Roman palace. In the foreground, two thieves make off with the head of a fallen statue while in the midground, an artist sketches the remains of two large sculptures. The symbolism of the painting is clear. In the wake of post-revolutionary France, with its destruction of the old order and its failure, at least in the short term, to produce a new one, museums, even great ones like the Louvre, stood little chance of surviving, while artists would continue to prosper regardless of the turmoil around them. Robert might be forgiven his dismay at the turn of events following the revolution, given his role under Louis XVI. 
but his painting taps into something deeper, the sense that many artists feel that it is they, not the institutions designed for the care for their work, that are most important. If Robert looked at the Louvre as an institution in ruins, destroyed by the French Revolution, his American counterpart, Charles Wilson Peale, saw the museum, and specifically his museum, as a living testament to the values of the American Revolution. Peale's museum, begun in Philadelphia at the end of the 18th century, had the distinction of being the first museum in the new United States. In 1822, the trustees of the museum commissioned a self-portrait from Peale, and the artist chose to depict himself, standing proudly in front of his museum, head thrust forward, one hand gesturing to come and look, the other pulling back a large, gold-trimmed red curtain to reveal his magnificent achievement. Peel built upon the Enlightenment model of the museum as an instrument of knowledge, in his words, a school of wisdom, but he also invoked the Renaissance notion of the Kunstkammer, or room of wonders, bringing together a wide array of paintings, scientific instruments, and objects of natural history in order to create an institution that could serve the needs of the nascent American democracy. His portraits of revolutionary generals memorialize the heroes of the recent war while his collection of objects provided a synopsis of the new world's scientific and cultural resources, thus providentially linking America to the great historical and natural events of the past. Like Robert, however, Peel places himself at the center of his creation. Great historical events may have transformed America, but it is through the work of the artist that these events are recognized and remembered something on the order of what Thomas was talking about earlier, pictures as means of forming and freezing the possibility of memory. The Museum for Peel may have been meant for a larger audience, but it was very much his enterprise reflecting his taste, his knowledge, and most importantly, his agency. Between his view of the museum as a school of wisdom and Robert's view of the museum as an imaginary rune, lies a broad range of potential ways of thinking about the institution that artists have explored and exploited over the last 200 years. Robert's direct heirs today are artists like Ed Ruscha, Christo, Richard Hamilton, and Ervin Vorms. Take, for instance, Ruscha's Los Angeles County Museum of Art on Fire, painted between 1965 and 1968. Seen from above and at a sharp angle, the painting depicts the museum which opened to the public only three years earlier with flames bursting from the back of its largest pavilion and smoke billowing from the roof. The painting was first shown at Irving Blum's gallery in Los Angeles and announced with great fanfare by the gallery through a telegram sent to its patrons stating that, and I quote, the gallery opens an exhibition by Edward Ruscha featuring a new painting titled L.A. County Museum of Art on Fire. Los Angeles Fire Marshal says he will attend. Stop. See the most controversial painting in town. Presented on the wall with several preparatory drawings, it was cordoned off from the public by a velvet rope, at once suggesting the elaborate proceedings of a movie premiere and the precious setting of an icon. At the time the painting was shown, the country, and Los Angeles in particular, was in turmoil, reeling from race riots that set large parts of South Los Angeles on fire, the war in Vietnam, and the assassination of Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy. Revolution, many felt, was around the corner, and in this heady mix of idealism and destruction, museums were not to be spared, as, Ruscha make, as Ruscha's painting makes clear. <clears throat> but Ruscha is too dispassionate an observer to simply want to echo the times. His painting does not actually show the county museum on fire, but rather an elaborate architectural model of the museum on fire, thus at once deftly decontextualizing the institution while generalizing it turning it into a commentary on the modernist ideal of a museum, as David Hickey has previously observed. At the same time, by rendering a model burning and not the museum, Ruscha keeps himself at one remove from the institution, in the same way that Robert keeps himself at a distance from the real Louvre through an imaginary view of the museum in ruins. Christo's proposal of 1971 to wrap the Museum of Modern Art in 70,000 square feet of canvas though never realized, sought to make the museum simply disappear. 
The proposal was part of a series of large-scale wrappings developed initially by Christo and then by Christo and his wife, Jean-Claude, to enshroud key public monuments in order to both call attention to them by disrupting their use and to provoke a complex civic dialogue about artistic expression. In the case of the Museum of Modern Art, which was one of several museum proposals made by Christo, the idea also involved inverting the traditional notion of the container and the contained, transforming the museum into an unusable object. Christo's proposal for the museum involved wrapping the building, covering the garden to the north of the museum in a vast translucent polyethylene skin, and constructing a 20-foot high barricade of 441 stacked oil barrels to block 53rd Street at the entrance to the museum. While Christo's proposal has affinities with earlier Dada and Surrealist work through its use of shrouding and its sly and enigmatic altering of the museum's physical presence, it also recalls, through its massive barricade, several centuries of street warfare, from Delacroix's Liberty Leading the People of 1830 to images of the Russian Revolution, the Second World War, and probably more pertinently to Christo, who lived in Paris in the early 1960s, the student uprisings of 1968. Richard Hamilton offers a less confrontational, though equally trenchant view of the museum in his Guggenheim series, initially made in 1965, but continued into the 1970s, based on a photograph of the museum that Lawrence Alloway, then a curator at the Guggenheim, sent the artist in 1965, shortly after Frank Lloyd Wright's iconic building was completed, Hamilton made a series of drawings and six fiberglass reliefs, one of which you see here, each four feet square in different colors, ranging from black to gold. Hamilton was interested in simulating the architectural process, in his words, from visualization of the building to planning to construction, and even later to photographing and publicizing it. His goal was to invert the, object, uh, the, invert the object as art by starting with architecture and working backwards to cast it into an object. Hamilton began by asking, does the neutrality of Duchamp or the studied banality, even vulgarity of the subject matter in most American pop art significantly exclude those products of mass culture which might be the choice of a New York Museum of Modern Art good design committee from our consideration? His insight, however, was to recognize that by altering the perspective of the, of the building in order to emphasize the concentric rings of its rotunda, and by altering the color of each panel, he could reveal the changing nature of the institution. From slick home to the fashionable crowd, to a generator of wealth and status. 40 years later, and after the Guggenheim's controversial franchising efforts in Bilbao, Berlin, and elsewhere, Erwin Worms presents a very different museum in his Guggenheim melting. The gleaming and iconic building that fascinated Hamilton has given way to a barely identifiable white mass slowly dissolving into a puddle. Hamilton's pop sensibility has been replaced by an ironic and even cynical twist. If Hamilton sees the Guggenheim as an object of fashion, wealth, and desire, and then if Christo and Roucher see museums as sites of contention and debate, then Marcel Brotters treats the institution as a conceptual project whose processes and systems are open to interpretation and critique. In his monumental Museum of Modern Art, Department of Eagles, realized between 1968 and 1972, he appropriates the practice of the institution itself. The project began in his house in Brussels but it had no permanent home or configuration. In each of its various manifestations, it developed wings or sections, beginning with a section on the 19th century and going on to include sections on cinema and finance, among many other topics. Since the museum had no permanent collection, its existence is evidenced only by installation photographs and the found objects, reproductions, packing crates, film, wall labels, signage, and multiples that Brotteres created to populate the museum. The Museum of Modern Art, Department of Eagles, works on the surface like a typical museum. Its objects are organized, cataloged, and displayed according to fairly straightforward taxonomic rules. But underneath the surface, it explodes the idea of the museum, subjecting its systems and methods to a rigorous critique that disputes the institution's authority 
by both mocking and mimicking its strategies of permanence and definitiveness. In doing so, Brotteres harks back to the pioneering work of Marcel Duchamp and his Boite en Valise, or Museum Retrospective in a Suitcase, and anticipates the pata historical efforts, Michael Bloom's tribute, uh, such as Michael Bloom's tribute to Safia Behar, which you see here, or David Wilson's Museum of Jurassic Technology, or even Orhan Pamuk's more recent Museum of Innocence. It also presages the institutional critiques of Andrea Fraser, who deconstructs the way art museums glorify objects and treat women, and Fred Wilson, who examines the way museums deal with the painful and often hidden stories of African Americans. The artist, however, who may have thought more about museums and how they are used is none other than Thomas Struth, who's here with us this afternoon and who just spoke. Beginning in the late 1980s and continuing until 2005, he has photographed museums in the United States and Europe, concentrating on the different ways people engage with art, each other, and the space of the institution. At the Art Institute of Chicago, for instance, he captures the solitude of quiet contemplation before Caillebotte's great painting, Paris Street, Rainy Weather of 1877. While at the Prado, he focuses, as he showed earlier, on a group of students and other tourists gathered before Velázquez's masterpiece, Las Meninas, and their varying responses to the painting, from wandering by it to ignoring it to listening to the acoustic guide account of the work. Like a scientist, Struth carefully observes the complex relationships that exist between the viewer and the viewed in order to foreground for us the importance of the act of seeing. This is particularly evident in his photographs at the Academia in Florence, where visitors are caught in rapt attention. We see people from all walks of life reflecting the degrees to which visiting museums has become an integral part of what might be called cultural tourism or a culture of leisure. Struth has caught them in various poses, clearly looking at something, a work of art presumably, but tellingly it is not visible. Instead, we are left with the effect created by the work of art, like the afterglow of an image. By focusing our attention on the audience rather than the object viewed, and by concentrating our gaze on the space of the academia, Struth underscores the social dimension of looking at art in public, a point I will return to at the end of this talk. Now, the idea of a museum or abode of the muses, the nine offspring of Zeus, and Nemezan, associated with the arts, owes its origins to antiquity. Museons, or shrines to the muses, were often associated with centers of learning, and most notably at the Library of Alexandria, where a circle of scholars was formed around one. Similarly, when Pythagoras arrived at Croton, he urged its citizens to build a shrine to the muses in the center of the city, because he believed it would promote civic harmony and learning. Thus, from the outset, the idea of a museum has been linked to urban life, civic space, and the public display of knowledge. And while the classical notion of a museum was predicated on the arts of poetry and rhetoric rather than on the visual arts, the conceptual underpinning of the institution as a place of inspiration and knowledge at the center of civic space remains intrinsic to the institution today. Most museums, despite their etymology, are derived from either the Renaissance idea of the Kunstkammer, or Cabinet of Wonders, or the Enlightenment idea that art can be scientifically organized and classified, like other forms of knowledge. A prime example of the first kind of institution is the Ashmolean Museum, here in a much later building than its original one, and beautifully uh, restored and expanded, uh, as I had the pleasure of seeing earlier today, which opened to the public in 1683 and was based on Elias Ashmole's extensive and eclectic collection of strange and wonderful man-made and natural objects, most of which he acquired by deed of gift from John Trudescant, whose father began assembling the collection at the beginning of the 17th century. Its modern heirs today include such institutions as the Wallace Collection in London, the Walters Collection in Baltimore, and the Frick Collection in New York, among many others. The British Museum, founded in 1753 by an act of parliament and open to the public 
in 1759 is a quintessential example of the second type. It too was originally based on a private collection, Sir Hans Sloan's, and consisted of some 71,000 books, natural specimens, and a small number of antiquities. To Sloan's collection were added many other objects and works of art acquired by the state, including books, manuscripts, medals, and more antiquities. At first, the museum was divided into three sections, books, including prints, manuscripts, including medals, and natural and artificial production, meaning everything else. The museum's goal was to present in a systematic and scientific fashion the history of ancient and classical art, and later, mirroring in large part Britain's expanding empire, the history of art from the Middle East, Asia, and Latin America. Among its many heirs today are such great institutions as the Louvre, Paris, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. The idea of a museum of modern art, as we understand it today, owes its origins to the Musée du Luxembourg in Paris, the museum that so concerned Kai Butt in the 1890s. And I'm sorry for this rather blurry, uh, pixelated image, but you'll get the impression. Created by Louis XVIII in 1819 as a venue for the collection and display of the work of living artists, the Musée du Luxembourg acted as a kind of testing ground for recent art not yet ready for admission to the permanent collection of the state. Works acquired by the Musée du Luxembourg were kept there until at least 10 years after the death of their respective artists, at which point those works, and I quote, whose glory had been confirmed by universal opinion, end of quote, only the French can write like that, whose works had been confirmed by universal opinion, and that were deemed of national significance, were transferred to the Musée du Louvre, while others were dispersed to regional museums. Similar arrangements developed in Germany and Britain, among other places. In Munich, for instance, the Alta Pinakothek, established by Ludwig I of Bavaria in 1826, was designed to house the Wittelbox Old Masters Collection, while the Neue Pinakothek, founded in 1853, was designed to house Ludwig's collection of modern or 19th century paintings, which he began forming in 1809 as Crown Prince. In Britain, the Tate Gallery, founded in 1897 as the National Gallery of British Art and named after Henry Tate, its initial donor, was originally part of the National Gallery of Art. <clears throat> in 1917, it was given the additional responsibility of forming a national collection of international modern art to distinguish it from the National Gallery, whose collections focused on art prior to 1900. And in 1954, a providential year, not only the birth of Thomas Struth, but mine as well, uh, it formally became an independent institution. The notion of a museum devoted specifically to modern art was given fresh impetus early in the 20th century by pioneering directors like Dorner in Germany and Barr in the United States. Barr traveled to Europe in 1927 to study contemporary European culture and to gather material for his intended thesis on the machine and modern art. Much of his thinking about modern art and ultimately the Museum of Modern Art was formulated during this trip. Among the many places he visited were London, Vienna, Moscow, Amsterdam, and Dessau, the home of the Bauhaus. He was particularly impressed by what he saw at the Bauhaus. Sorry, get there, um, quite a difference. Uh, he was particularly impressed by what he saw at the Bauhaus. Founded in 1919 by the architect Walter Gropius, the Bauhaus was a radical school that endeavored to teach the interdisciplinarity of the arts and crafts, including painting, textile design, architecture, and photography, and brought together some of the most daring and progressive artists and architects of the day, such as Hannes Meyer, Mies van der Rohe, uh, Jonas Itten, Sophie Tauber Arp, Oskar Schlemmer, Vasily Kandinsky, and Paul Klee, almost all of whose works would be ultimately collected by the Museum of Modern Art. Now, Barr was predisposed to the Bauhaus approach, having previously taught a course on modern art at Wellesley College that focused on painting and sculpture, as well as graphic design, music, film, and architecture, and saw in the Bauhaus a model for a discipline or medium-based program, rather than one organized by epoch or geography. At the same time, from Dorner, he absorbed the idea of the museum as a place of learning and discovery, committed to living artists. The result was the creation of the first museum in North America to declare itself specifically modern, identifying itself with what Barr believed to be the most progressive tendencies in art. 
by which he meant art that was original and daring and that challenged traditional or established canons. <clears throat> the museum, in his words, was to be a laboratory in which the public was invited to participate and was, in its early years, organized around departments of painting and sculpture, architecture and design, film and photography. Later, departments of prints and illustrated books, drawings, and most recently, media and performance were added. By acting as a disruptive innovator, to use a term more often associated with the business world, but applicable here as a way of describing an almost epistemological reconsideration of what it meant to be a museum, the Museum of Modern Art was able to rapidly develop outstanding collections that focused on artists otherwise ignored by most pre-existing museums and innovative programs that appealed to a new audience that was not being served by existing institutions and that was either un that pre-existing institutions that were either uninterested or unaware of this new audience's needs. The catalyst for this was the financial and moral support the museum received in 19 29 from its founding trustees, and you see three of them here, especially Miss Lily P. Bliss, Mrs. Cornelius Sullivan, and Mrs. John D. Rockefeller, and you see them uh, surrounding Alfred Barr, who were determined to create a museum devoted exclusively to the most progressive tendencies in modern art. The museum's success was based on its willingness to take a great deal of risk in the art that it collected, as well as how that art was displayed and interpreted. For Barr, this meant thinking of the galleries as a means of presenting a coherent story of modern art articulated through a series of developments in which human agency, in the words of the scholar and curator John Elderfield, is constrained by the force of immutable movements. The result of the Museum of Modern Art's disruption was not only the creation of a new museum that fundamentally or altered an old order, but the creation of an entirely new kind of museum that used a different architectural language, appealed to a different audience, related to the city in a new way, and behaved differently. Where previous museums were predicated on the idea that preserving the past was essential to making history and its lessons accessible and real to us, to use David Carrier's term, museums of modern art operate from a different position. They are predicated on the idea that the present is essential to any understanding of who we are, and that the past can only be understood through the lens of the present moment. Disruption theory argues that disruption occurs when pre-existing institutions either ignore a set of new interests, such as contemporary art, or leave them to someone else because they prefer to concentrate on what they believe is their core mission. The process of disruption creates a kind of asymmetric motivation, constraining existing institutions who invariably respond by focusing on their current interests and audiences and almost never try to reach out or defend uh, reach out to establish and defend these new ideas. And often, in fact, they simply ignore them because they seem so alien or different. In the cultural context, specifically in the United States, but maybe elsewhere as well, such a muted reaction may be especially salient because not-for-profit organizations like museums operate with more limited resources than commercial enterprises and have a heightened tendency to allocate those resources toward their existing interests and audiences on whom they invariably depend for funding. The Museum of Modern Art was founded in large part because then in existing art museums were uninterested in either collecting or displaying modern art, what we would call today contemporary art. The Metropolitan Museum of Art, arguably the foremost museum in America, founded in 1870, had previously attempted to show modern art, but this was met with such derision that it quickly abandoned the effort. The Metropolitan's critics claimed in a four-page printed protest that this modernistic degenerate cult is simply the Bolshevik philosophy applied to art. <laughs> Gotta love it. By the time that the Museum of Modern Art was founded, Jerome Klein was able to write in the Boston transcript, and I quote, that for a number of years, the worthy trustees of America's greatest museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, has been subjected to have been subjected to considerable embarrassment. A great many people have had the bad taste to inquire in public print why the competent administrators of the museum have taken no cognizance of the emergence of art in the world of today. The clamor grew, and the trustees and their henchmen awoke one day to the horrible discovery that Cezanne and his upstarts had for years been taken up by the best of society. 
End of quote. In short, the Museum of Modern Art has been called the Metropolitan's worst mistake because it disrupted the existing model in a way that made it difficult, if not impossible, for the Metropolitan or any other pre-existing museum to follow. It did so by focusing on contemporary art and by treating the galleries, and there's the Metropolitan, actually isn't doing so badly if you look carefully. Um, it did so by focusing on contemporary art and treating the galleries not as a venue for the taxonomic display of the past, but as a laboratory where new ideas could be explored and where the public was invited to participate. In the words of Barr, the founding director of the museum, nothing that visitors will see in the exhibition galleries, neither the works of art, nor the lighting fixtures, nor even the partitions, is at present permanent. By thinking of the museum in this way, Barr defined it as a venue of scientific as well as aesthetic experimentation, open and accessible to all who are interested in modern art. This notion of creating a museum that was both popular and populist in spirit led the institution to break away from the prevailing architectural language, here the Philadelphia Museum of Art, used for building museums at the time, with its heavy reliance on classical and neoclassical references, and to adopt the language of international modernism. It also led the museum to place its entrance directly on the street instead of up an imposing flight of stairs, typically used by other museums to set themselves apart from the activity and noise of the street. By doing so, the museum radically altered its relationship with the public as well as the city itself and declared that it not be understood as a quiet sanctuary or retreat, but as part of the hectic and ever-changing life of the urban setting, open to all. The idea of the Museum of Modern Art as a laboratory meant that it accepted the fact that it was to be in a constant state of flux and even uncertainty, evolving and changing as modern art and our understanding of modern art evolves and changes. This sense of flux can most easily be seen in the way the museum refers to itself, which has changed several times from its early appellation as the Museum of Modern Art to the modern in the 1950s and 60s and now MoMA, as well as the fact that in less than 80 years it has undergone seven major architectural renovations and expansions. Moving from its first temporary space on Fifth Avenue, which is the building to the left of the large now hotel called the Plaza, uh, where we opened in 1929, to a leased townhouse at 11 West 53rd Street in 1932, to its first custom-built home in 1939. And what's wonderful about this image is you can see the kind of exuberance of the Museum of Modern Art uh, in 1939. It puts its sign not on the wall of the building, but on the roof, declaring itself to be part of this vertical city, uh, to its present uh, iteration designed by Yono Yoshio Taniguchi in 2004. The recognition the Museum of Modern Art achieved for the artists it championed, such as Cezanne and Van Gogh, Seurat and Gauguin, but also Matisse and Picasso, among others, combined with the impact of its publications and exhibitions, made it a model for other institutions in North America, Europe, Asia, and Latin America, seeking to deal with modern art. In some cases, like the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, founded in 1935, the uh, Musée National d'Art Moderne in 1937, which succeeded the Musée de Luxembourg in Paris, the Sao Paulo Museum of Modern Art in 1948 in Brazil, the Kamakura Museum of Modern Art in 1951 in Japan, entirely new museums were built. In others, such as the Art Institute of Chicago or the Metropolitan Museum of Art, new departments were created as late as the 1960s. <clears throat> In addition to these relatively large public museums, many smaller museums of modern art were created around this time as well in Europe, North America, and Asia, often based on private collections, such as a Volkswagen Museum in Hagen, established in 1902 through the gift of Karl Ernst Osthaus's 19th and 20th century art, and subsequently moved to Essen in 1922. The Barnes Foundation in Marion, Pennsylvania, which houses Barnes' extensive collection of post-impressionist and early modern masterworks, and which opened to the public by appointment in 1925, or the Ohara Museum of Art outside Tokyo, Japan, which opened to the public in 1930 and is based on Ohara Magosaburo's collection of 19th and 20th century French paintings and sculptures, and perhaps more recognizably, 
the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum, designed by Frank Lloyd Wright in 1959, to house Guggenheim's collection of non-objective art. The growth in the number of museums devoted to modern and contemporary art throughout the 20th century and now the 21st century is paralleled by a dramatic growth of interest in the field by the general public as well as scholars. Despite their success and popularity, however, museums of modern art face a number of challenges. To what extent, for instance, is it practical or even desirable to present a coherent overview of a tradition or an era whose history is not yet fully developed or understood and is disruptive by nature? Is it possible to still relate the most recently made works of art to those over now 100 years old? Does it still make sense to divide an institution's collections by medium? How should museums deal with art from regions such as Latin America, Asia, or the Middle East, whose histories are different from those of Europe and North America, and for whose artists terms such as progressive or avant-garde might have very different meanings? Is there something unique and distinct about the impact of globalization and the explosion of interest in contemporary art today that changes our understanding of what a museum of modern art should be? Is it even possible to understand the breadth of what's happening today? There are, of course, no easy answers to this question. And museums of modern art must constantly grapple with how to address the problem of remaining disruptive and new while becoming increasingly part of an established order or accepted canon. How can they balance, for instance, their commitment to the new and progressive while simultaneously collecting and displaying works by artists like Seurat and Van Gogh and Cezanne that were radical and new when they were made, but are now well over a century old. Some, like the Museum of Modern Art, have endeavored to do this by imagining the collection as metabolic and constantly evolving. This is Barr's description of our collection as a torpedo moving through time, with the nose, the ever-advancing uh, future, and the tale of the ever-receding past. But it has proven problematic and at times contentious to shed those works of art through deaccessioning or trade that have become recognized masterpieces in favor of the new and not yet fully appreciated. And in any event, deaccessioning or selling works of art in order to acquire other works of art is a peculiarly American approach, not practiced by most European museums. More productively, many museums, such as the Tate Modern, or the Centre Pompidou are experimenting with different ways of presenting their collections, whether through refreshed historical narratives or through th thematic investigations or by periodic rehangings designed to explore different facets of modern and contemporary art from questions of identity and gender to the impact of specific moments in artists. To the degree, however, that the art of a museum of, to the degree, however, that the idea of a museum of modern art implies a dedication to works of art whose histories are not yet fixed or fully fixed. Any attempt to articulate a cohesive and concise narrative is more likely to be provisional than definitive. So let me now turn to my final set of observations. They concern what I see as the most pressing issues affecting museums of modern art today as they look to the future. These include the changing nature of contemporary art itself, the growth in the audience for that art, and the impact of the internet. If the 1970s and 80s witnessed a massive escalation in the scale of contemporary art, from Richard Serra's monumental sculptures to room-sized installations such as Martin Kippenberger's Kafka in America that require museums to either build special galleries large enough and structurally sound enough to accommodate these works of art, or devote a considerable amount of existing space to their display, then the first years of the 21st century have witnessed a renewed interest in performance-based art in what might be called participatory art. Both of these trends create unique demands on museums and compel them to adapt to a very different set of expectations if they want to remain disruptive. In the case of performance, spaces need to be found that can accommodate artistic acts that often challenge audiences and pose both, pose both logistical and ethical problems for institutions. Two examples from recent projects at the Museum of Modern Art make this clear. In the spring of 2010, the museum presented The Artist is Present, a retrospective of Marina Abramovich's performance over the last 40 years. The exhibition included the reperformance of five earlier works, as well as the presentation of a new piece, The Artist is Present, in which Marina invited anyone in the museum to sit in silence with her 
for as long as they wished, and from which the exhibition took its title. All of the re-performances raised questions about the degree to which such acts were legitimate interpretations of Marina's original performances or simply theatrical restagings of earlier events. Marina quite dramatically says the difference between theater and performance art is that in the theater, everything is made up. It's an act. It's something else. Whereas in performance, everything that happens is real and immediate. So the knife that cuts into your skin in the theater doesn't produce real blood, but when it scores your skin in performance, as she often does with her own skin, it's real. This was made even more complicated, this notion of the difference between per performance and reperformance, by the fact that in the case of Imponderabilia, first performed in 1977, and which involved Marina and her then partner Ulai, standing naked, one on either side of a door frame, requiring visitors to pass between them. In the re-performance, Marina decided to mix genders so that there were male-female uh, and male-male and female-female pairs, thus substantially altering the nature of the performance and the experience of choosing whether to face toward or away from someone of the opposite gender. What was not evident, at least initially, was the degree to which managing more than 20 performers performing eight hours a day, mostly in the nude, and up to 15,000 people a day who wanted to sit with Marina and were required to sign waivers in order for their time with the artist to be recorded, created unanticipated stresses and strains on the museum's staff and visitors. We had to hire new staff to deal with the performers in their complex schedules, psychologists to deal with their trauma uh, as they were brushed up against, literally. I mean, you don't ever think about this when you run a museum, but because we deal with inanimate objects most of the time. But these were very difficult situations for the performers, none of whom, of course, who had ever done this before. So no matter how hard they had trained themselves to be subject to literally thousands of anonymous people brushing up against them a day became a problem for the institution how to ensure their safety, psychological as well as physical, and how to train a security staff to deal with these complex situations. In other words, performance is not only something for the audience to contend with, it is also something for the institution to deal with. Another work pushed the museum even further. In Yoko Ono's, sorry, this is just Marina sitting uh, from above, uh, in Yoko Ono's voice piece for Soprano, visitors were invited to step up to a microphone and scream against the wind, the wall, and the sky. The result was periodic and on some days almost continual shrieks and shouts that shot out from the museum's atrium, intruding into the space of adjacent galleries and even the temporary exhibition spaces four stories above the atrium. While voice piece for Soprano was meant as a transgressive piece, designed to disturb and interrupt its surroundings, and you should all be grateful that I'm not actually playing you uh, a video <laughs> clip. Designed to dis disturb and interrupt its surroundings and to challenge institutional authority, the reality of the disruption it created in the otherwise relatively tranquil exhibition spaces around it caused many of the museum's own curators to complain about the work. Guards to be rotated more frequently or reassigned to other parts of the building and an information program developed in order to explain to visitors that the screams were part of an artwork and that they too could shriek if they wished to. <laughs> Unlike an object that once installed requires little further attention, performance forces an institution into an entirely new mode of operation that can be unsettling as well as exhilarating. Imponderabilia and voice piece for a soprano challenge the Museum of Modern Art to develop new ways of dealing with its staff, internal processes, and audiences. But they also highlighted the degree to which works of art that encourage participation have become integral to contemporary practice. Artists, whether performance-based, such as Marina and Yoko, or relational, such as Rick Rattier and Philip Pereno, are eager to stretch the boundaries of art making and to engage in a social relationship with their public. And museums of modern art, if they want to stay current, are going to have to reconfigure their spaces in order to enable these kinds of practices to take place. 
In doing so, they transform the relationship audiences have with them and create opportunities for the public to shift from being observers to being participants. This is especially evident in works like Roman Andox, Measuring the Universe, where everyone entering a gallery is invited to have his or her height and initials marked on a wall. Without the participation of the museum's public, the piece literally does not exist. And for an audience hungry to engage with art, to see it as more than something abstract and removed from their life, Measuring the Universe offers those who participate an opportunity to not only help make a work of art, but to have themselves literally inscribed into the fabric of the museum. The explosion of interest in modern and contemporary art and the new audiences that are driving this means that museums of modern art must find ways to contend with both the growth in and changing nature of these audiences on site as well as over the internet. The implications of this are considerable. Throughout most of the 20th century, museums of modern art were largely Western constructs with predominantly European and North American collections serving mostly European and North American audiences. Today, with, the, with important centers of artistic production in Asia, Latin America, Africa, as well as Australia, North America, and Europe, and with ever-growing audiences from these areas, the museum, its interests, and its users needs to be framed within a global context. Where it might have been possible a decade to define with clarity who visited museums, this is no longer possible, and the extensive use of the internet only exaggerates the problem. While digital sites may have initially been conceived of simply as extensions of the physical space of museums, a kind of sophisticated form of promotion, it has rapidly become clear that the most successful online museum sites are those that recognize that they are independent locations related to, but not identical to their parent institutions. They not only have their own programs and contents, but their own audience that is different from that of the parent institution. To take only the example of the Museum of Modern Art, last year just over 3 million people visited us at 53rd Street, while over 16 million people visited us online. And I'm sure the same kind of numbers are true for virtually every other major museum. Among the many consequences of this is that both the intellectual and physical space of the museum needs to be rethought. The space of the museum in this context is not simply an artistic or intellectual one, but also a social and virtual one based on the complex network of relationships that exist between viewers and objects as well as those that exist between viewers and each other, something that I think is so admirably caught in the photographs of Thomas Struth. And of course, all of the above with the institution itself, not to mention the millions of people who may never actually visit the museum in real space. The museum seen in this way becomes a locus for a broad range of artistic, intellectual, and social experiences that cannot be understood only through the lens of art history. Psychology, sociology, and linguistic theory, among others, are needed to address the, the questions of this globalized art world. Complicating this is the fact that what was once an intimate experience shared by a relatively few people from similar social and intellectual backgrounds has become a hugely popular experience shared by many from around the world and with diverse backgrounds and interests. Some critics have seen this explosion of attendance as eroding the ability for any one visitor to directly engage with a discrete object and in so doing undermining the importance of the institution and diminishing the value of the art shown. Others have seen this as a fulfillment of modern art's democratic and populist impulses and increasing the importance of art as part of our everyday experience. In either case, the idea of the museum as a laboratory needs to be expanded to include the notion of the museum as a crucible, that is a place where intersecting interests and opportunities can connect to and with each other, forging new relationships and networks of affiliation for a diverse range of people. Art, of course, is the catalyzing force that is at the center of this process, enabling connections and relationships to be made. But these are amplified and refracted by social interactions and the coruscating impact of digital technologies and the internet in particular, that stream information and connections seamlessly to anyone interested inside or out of the museum. Where a decade ago, engaging with a museum for most people meant visiting a physical space, today this is no longer true as the associations and possibilities created by the museum 
extend well beyond its walls through a wide range of mediums, including traditional publications, but also uh, online sites, cell and smartphones, that enable ongoing social connections and conversations to be created in, around, and about the museum. The overlapping and intersecting nature of these conversations and experiences suggests that as the space between the real and the virtual collapses, traditional notions of the museum as a single physical space whose works of art can only be experienced in real time is rapidly being replaced by the idea of the museum as a generator of knowledge and ideas whose works of art belong to a continuum of experiences that include what is happening in the galleries as well as what is taking place on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, among many other possible sites. Well, I've talked for far too long, so let me conclude by underscoring three, internet, three interconnected ideas that began this lecture. The first is that artists from the 18th century on, if not before, have seen the museum as both a subject and object of their interest, and it is through them that we can best understand the potential contradictions and constraints of the institution. The second is that museums of modern art came about in the early 20th century in tandem with the creation of new modes of artistic expression, what we conveniently call modern art, and new audiences for this art, disrupting in the process traditional historical museological models. And the third is that museums of modern art remain today disruptive as they continue to be transformed by a variety of forces, including new artistic practices, new audiences, and new modes of experiencing the museum itself. By responding to the work of artists not yet accepted or even understood by more established institutions and the audiences for this new work, museums of modern art can be seen over the course of the last hundred years as reframing the museum from a historical space primarily concerned with the classifying orders of the past to a laboratory in Barr's notion of the Museum of Modern Art in which to explore current events and experiences to a crucible today in which a wide range of real and virtual experiences of art at a global scale are playing off, collapsing upon, and reinforcing each other in an almost endless network of possibilities. Thank you very much.